has some new materials from past coverage. So honestly, I, I um, feel that attempts to um, cover this material are uh, uh, everywhere I've seen that has attempted to do this um, uh, has, has not quite hit the mark. And we're gonna try to use, you know, custom discussions with each project together with this material to, to thread this needle for you. Um, I'm gonna be showing some slides here. And really I should probably make these slides available pronto for people um, so you could follow along uh, directly. But I wanna highlight um, also some materials which are currently online um, uh, on this, on this, uh, in this area. So in the model conceptualization area um, for the boot camp, you will have um, uh, access to six, um, six different uh, files, which kind of grapple with this from, from different sides. The hallmarks for complex systems is more about, hey, are you, you know, are there signs that what you're dealing with is in fact a complex systems issue? It's more than a complicated issue. It's a it's an issue where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, and the, I talked a little bit about that, but that's kind of the odd man out here, um, the odd person out. So beyond this, um, uh, we have some of my slides from this morning are, are are included in here, but I'm going to actually update this right now because I've added some slides. I didn't have recourse to it before, but I've just just added some this morning. So I'm gonna put those um, here uh, in a way that um, that's available. And then um, there are some additional topics which, which I think are quite helpful. Um, one of the exercises we'll be going through today is between endogenous, exogenous, and ignored. This is a division that's commonly emphasized in system dynamics. Um, and it's one of the many strengths of, of um, I think, the tradition that's built up there. But there's a set of other kind of key questions and reflections and motivations here um, that I'll be making reference to. Many of these are parts of my slides, but I've tried to parcel them out. Um, uh, I've also got this sort of key questions and boundary and methodology selection, which myself, Ross Hammond, and Liz Brooke came up with. Uh, at one point, um, bit of a compromised document, to be honest, but it's uh, it's okay. Um, and um, and then I talk about unpacking to causal pathways, which for many health scientists coming to system science is one of the foremost challenges that we find. Um, and maybe these will help, maybe they won't. Um, I find some people have an intuition for this in a immediate understanding. And for other people, it's a big barrier because they're thinking associational. It's not a matter of being really quantitative or not. No, no, no. It's just a lot of people who are very quantitative traditionally in health sciences or social sciences are thinking associationally. They want to go, you know, undertake a project that will help them um, uh, help them um, figure out the association between X and Y. And phrasing it like that almost short circuits the ability for you to get the most effective insights with, um, with dynamic modeling. Dynamic modeling can be useful to give understanding of why we see certain associations, but it's about the underlying system. It's about the system that underlies these associations, that gives rise to, it's about the data generating process, to use the language of statistics. And, um, and so, you know, some of these slides may be useful there. Um, what I've done though, to to sort of uh, finish uh, this out is, is, is also asked you to go through a systems mapping and sort of scenario selection exercise um, where I use a framework I introduced yesterday or, or a close variant of it. This is a close cousin of Ross Hammond's Parquet framework for agent-based modeling, et cetera, um, for sort of conceptualizing aspects of models. And this framework, um, is asking you to kind of think through explicitly different elements of, of models. Um, so um, 
as we'll see for this morning's exercise, I'm asking you to, to try to use some of these materials for thinking through your problem, both sketching out what's in your mind, what would you like to be endogenous, exogenous, and ignored on the one hand, and then using exercises like this to get started and think what your age-based model might look like. The first of those deals more with scope. The second of these deals with what, like what are the pieces that might emerge in an agent-based model? The parameters, the actions, the rules, the interventions you're dealing with, the aspects of the environment, what is, what's the underlying state that's evolving? Um, so we'll come back to this, but I just, I just wanna highlight that these resources are there. Okay, and um, we'll be making use of them this afternoon to accompany, excuse me, uh, this morning and this afternoon to accompany, um, to accompany this since we'll be spending the time on ABM conceptualization. Okay, so back to the slides. Um, so, I yesterday, I spoke, I spoke to you of, of an analogy of which I am rather fond. And the analogy was of models as maps. Um, and I argued that just as um, all maps were of necessity and derived their value from being simplification, so it is with all models. We derive value from models precisely because of simplifications of many things in the world. Um, they offer utility. We can simulate them in a reasonable time amongst other things. Just like we could you know, carry a map on our smartphone or, or in our glove compartment of our, of our car. Um, but like maps, the simplifications are problem, are, are problem specific. They're, we, we simplify in certain ways because we have certain questions we're bringing to the table. We have certain problems that we're seeking to address. We don't just build a model of, you know, uh, the health system in some, in some inchoate way. We don't build a model of population health um, as a whole in some undifferentiated way. We need to we need to have a boundary. We need to have some specific interests that will let us exclude certain things and otherwise include them. Um, there's been some famous projects that have stumbled on this road. There's a, a, a notable project in the US for creating a model of the immune system, which aspired to create you know, an exact replica, in, a, in silico replica, digital replica of the immune system. And, and, you know, I can see many advantages of that. I've done a lot of immune modeling myself. But if there's no boundary, you know, you're asked, what can I leave out? And if the answer is nothing, you have to have it all in there. You're setting yourself up again for a full cycle. Um, you, you're you're going to create a model that at the least is intractable and, and really realistically will never convert. Um, so... Models are simplification. You know, some people like to use your quote George Box and say, you know, all models are wrong, some are useful. And, and I think that has a certain place. Um, but the point here is that, you know, a perfect representation is, is not in the cards. And um, it's not, uh, it, it won't be in your interest to pursue one. Um, and what we use as, the factor to allow us to simplify is model purpose. That's what allows us to give our model focus so we know what to keep in and what to leave out. Okay. Um, it's the model purpose. John Sturman talks about that being a logical knife to cut away unnecessary complexity in a model. Um, and and I, I've, um, going, I've, I've mentioned here, you know, just a couple of purposes which your model might have. These are not in any way privileged. This is a somewhat arbitrary subset. Um, but you may want to explain reference modes. And agent-based modeling is going to include spatial reference modes. Um, it can include you know, network-based. Why do we see you know, chlamydia and gonorrhea survive in core networks in, uh, um, of sexual 
sexual transmission, even though it does not survive in the general population. Um, you might want to understand you know, quantitatively trade-offs between policies, for example, or you might want to ask, you know, is Bob Brunham's hypothesis on blunted immunity associated with with early treatment with STIs of sexually transmitted infection, is that is that consistent with the evidence? Um, so you build you want to build a model that will help you test this hypothesis. If it's consistent. And in other cases, so this is really something that's that quite emphasized in system dynamics. You know, your model. It's it's interesting. You know, different quarters of the modeling world have this different aspirations. And honestly, the situation here reminds me a lot of uh, the situation with world religions in like the late 1900s. All these world religions that were previously only vaguely aware of until they discovered each other. And um, the practitioners in many of those religions um, tended to try to judge other religions and sort of compare them against their own in a way that was normative, in a way that said, you know, why our religion is better than theirs. And it was very interesting because the criteria they used to judge them were in fact taken from their own religion. And they asked, how do these other religions stack up against theirs and according to the criteria that's considered important for their religion? And of course, the religions differed from each other perhaps most profoundly in the questions they were asking, but they were held up against each other um, by practitioners of a given religion as if they tried to answer the same question. Um, so, you know, when there were certain ones who will ask, you know, what is the creation story of this one or, or uh, of this other religion and, and, you know, try to cast aspersions on that. I think it's very similar with modelers, honestly. Uh, that this is the best analogy that I can give you for having spent 30 years in the modeling wilderness, um, uh, where I'm, I'm, you know, sort of not, not viewed as being a, a true member of any one, one camp. I'm sort too much with models of, of varied sorts for certain people's comfort. And the truth is that, um, that each, each type of modeling judges others by its own standards too often. And uh, here, you know, there's, um, there's a uh, propensity for certain of these methods to ask some of the questions and not others. So agent-based modeling has um, a strong emphasis traditionally on explaining reference modes. I would use here Schelling segregation model as a classic example of this, by the way, which is available as an example model in any logic. You can fire it up and run it, you know, explaining why we see patterns of segregation. Um, it's, not, it's not simulating it in Detroit or New York or Watts in LA or, or what have you. It is, it is instead formulating kind of a theory of a very simple explanation and asking, could that give rise to patterns similar to what we see with segregation? Um, other models here in, in the agent-based modeling area um, allow us thinking through the implications of a small number of factors, ruling out certain hypotheses. We certainly see that. Um, and quantitatively understanding policy impacts. Almost no agent-based models related to Michael's question, I think it was yesterday, relate to this final bullet point there, which I put in because sometimes I like being provocative in a way that tries to get people out of cherished prejudices. In ancient based model, we tend not to, we tend not to do that. Not a good reason, but in system dynamics, there's a lot of respect for building models to bring people together. The goal of the model is not to answer some scientific question, it is to bring people together who otherwise wouldn't be talking to catalyze dialogue and to use the model as a boundary object to, to instill discussion across the, the, the boundaries of people who otherwise would be at loggerheads. Think the Snake River Explorer of Andrew Ford, for example, or some of Christina Beale's work, um, some work in environmental resource management, et cetera where the goal of the model is to stimulate, to stimulate sort of consensus building and, and, and talk across boundaries. 
that's a purpose of a model. It's a perfectly good purpose of a model. It just tends to be one which agent-based models have almost never been used for, for no good reason. In some ways, they're as good, and sometimes for some areas, arguably better boundary objects in, than, say, a stock and flow model. So, so just be aware that you need a, a model purpose in mind. It's not necessarily one purpose. It could be a, a cluster of purposes. But you need some point of of them, um, and uh, you're, and that's going to allow you to think about model model boundaries. I see there's a, a chat here. Um, uh, more on model as boundary object. Okay, excellent, excellent. Uh, what does that mean? Okay, so um, I I will if people are interested, I could insert a brief lecture on models. For uh, as participatory process in participatory processes, models for collaboration and community engagement. If people are interested in that, please indicate. Um, okay, um, I'm hearing some interest uh, for those in the room. Um, are people interested? Um, okay, I, I will commit to that. I'll just say two sentences about it right now. When I say a mandrel is a boundary object, what I mean is this. Yeah, this is gonna be hard for two sentences, okay? <laughs> Maybe 20 sentences. So basically what it's going to be is you're gonna have people from very different backgrounds who speak different languages, okay? And maybe you have people with lived experience of homelessness of substance use on the streets on the one hand. Maybe you have people who are clinicians on the other. Maybe you have epidemiologists and public health folks and folks from social services and criminal justice and policing at the table. These folks speak totally different languages. I work from all those backgrounds, and I know the, the language. Um, and uh, if you put them in a room and try to get them to talk normally, um, normally, you get them to talk, you know, in their own lingos, often they talk past each other. Um, uh, there's, there's, uh, a lack of full communication, I'll just put it that way. There, there's some communication, there's no denying that, but there's, there's a lack of full communication. But part of it is because they're using different languages to, to speak about some common areas of the system. It's just they're, they're thinking about it and talking about it with different jargons. And a model, th this may sound odd, particularly for those who traditionally think of agent-based models as a bunch of code, you know, you, you thrust Java code in their face. And you might think like, well, what, how is that gonna help this situation? And uh, no, 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 it's not about that at all. You put, up, you put up a model as a visual artifact. Think about those state charts. Think about stocks and flows and system dynamic theory. Think about structured workflows and discrete events. You put that in front of people. And you wouldn't think this, but it's true. People from all different backgrounds, if you give a bit of explanation for what this represents, what that represents in the model, they actually can start to use the model as kind of a focus of discussion. They can point to common things in the model and say, you know, I think you've got this wrong, or this area is where there's problems. This is where people are falling through the cracks. This is where there's a lack of service coordination. You know, it's it's when people are falling off the bus at this point or that point, or or people are overdosing here, and there's another area of overdose over there. They they will point at the model, come in, in in common, and they'll use the model as a common point of kind of. It's almost like they have a globe. You know, globes. I I love globes when I was I was little. Right. Um. You you can imagine a bunch of people from different. Um, different backgrounds or languages pointing at a globe and and they all recognize like this is Europe here. And maybe they say the name of the countries in Europe from their own language or something. Maybe they don't speak common language, but by pointing at it, they know they're talking about England or they know they're talking about the US or something like that. And so they can use it as a point of discussion, even though they don't speak the common language, basically. Um, it's it's similar to you know how you might if you travel overseas you know hold the phone up to someone and one person says you know um, uh, yeah and another person says you know um, 
uh, telephone, and, and another person says, you know, cell phone or whatever, handphone, um, pocket phone, wh whatever it is, they can point at it in common, and they will say, you know, um, that's that's it in this language. And models can serve like that. And there's been some wonderful work done sort of almost in an ethnographic way about how models function in this way. It's, it's you know, it's a little bit of, of ethnography or, or, or anthropology to study how models are used. And there's some fascinating work about it. Um, yeah, um, it can be well adapted to pursue decolonization. I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, there's been some interesting work done here at our university um, uh, that I was somewhat involved with for um, for use of models with indigenous communities, for example, um, around around issues like this. Um, so I agree on a great deal of, of potential here. Um, so, um, and, and the key thing is, it's not like the model is guaranteed to be correct there. It's just, it's using it to, to, to catalyze dialogue and to have people be able to speak, um, um, not past each other, but about a common, a common factor. Um, so um, here, you know, adding new factors often does not lead to, to added insight. I want to talk about the model process here a little bit, and, and we're going to zoom in on, on a certain area of that. So for those who are newer to modeling or who have not heard this talk about before, there's a lot of thoughtful work that's gone on um, on the modeling process. There's many quarters of models where the focus is avowedly just on the models themselves. Um, I think mathematical epidemiology, um, I'm saying infectious diseases, is particularly focused on the models as mathematical objects. But in system dynamics um, uh, and in discrete event simulation, there's a lot of attention to the modeling process that gives rise to the model. And, and I think this is bang on because I, as I articulated yesterday, often the real value of models is not the model as artifact, it's the modeling. It's the thinking through with the model. And you can have a success of modeling even with a model that's many times proved problematic. Um, often a modeling process delivers great value even if the model itself you know, were to disappear, you, you've really advanced common understanding by stakeholders. We've got them talking the same language, we've got them critically thinking about the underlying processes. The model got you there, but the model is not the only thing that's secured value through that. It's built up value because of a human process that's given rise to it, which has brought diverse knowledge from across an organization together. This is, this is a key point. So modeling takes place in a multi-stage process. And I've tried to illustrate, you know, sort of uh, iteration here with backwards arrows. But it proceeds from model conceptualization and problem conceptualization through sort of mapping out informally a model. Often this is with causal loop diagrams or, or, um, or other variants of them. Uh, we have for example, agent-based variants of them that we have formulated and some tools that help with that in the past. Model formulation, where you're actually making the model precise, again, not accurate, precise, I mean, very specific, specific enough to run. And then you're calibrating the model against data. Um, often that leads challenges with the model. You've learned things need adjustment. You go back, you might even change the boundary of the model is set by conceptualization. And then um, a model testing phase, you could argue that often occurs before calibration and that's, that's quite right. And then sort of policy evaluation. Um, through all of this, our mental models, and you know, really this is an overly individual focus. Really this should be like institutional knowledge is being built up as well. It's, it's, it's broader than our just mental model. It's, it's collective understanding, it's common parlance, just like a enterprise resource management um, you know, project brings together people from around the company, uses the common language, standardized definitions. Um, so it is with model. In this university, when they started 
across university uh, enterprise resource planning ID system. They discovered the university in different quarters had seven different definitions of what's a student. Um, so when it came to borrowing books, there was one definition. When it came to you know, enrolling in classes, there was another definition. When it came to using the physical activities complex, it was a different definition. And it was really bringing all those people together that they standardized definitions. They standardized um, the way the processes for classifying different types of conditions. And so it is with model. Now, I want to talk, and this relates to some questions that came up yesterday. And I, I discovered this was kind of a tacit bit of knowledge on my part. Um, uh, and over the years, I've, I've realized as recently as yesterday in some of the dialogue that I really need to get this down in a place that I can share with others. Um, not because it's deeply insightful, because it's useful. Um, so when we go through model, building a model, what I heard about yesterday was a fair bit of discussion, you know, about the role of programming and do I need to learn Java and, you know, um, the barriers associated with programming languages and building models. And I, I engaged with that and I, I spoke about it and Wade did as well and Lisa and others. But, you know, in my mind, we were talking about a very specific component of modeling that in my mind is not actually the biggest barrier. We were talking about model implementation. Model implementation right now for agent-based models requires bits of computer programming. Our group is working to try to minimize that. We've got other lines of work that are more pattern-oriented going on that I'm really quite enthusiastic about that might minimize the amount of classic programming. But right now, just like using R, you need to use an R language uh, that's a programming language. Um, here to use model, to, to implement a model, to take your agent-based model and put it into a form that's operational, you need to use a bit of computer programming, or, you know, anywhere from a bit to a lot, depending on the sophistication. And many people, when they come to agent-based modeling, that's what they bug out about. That's where, like, their eyes are. Really big, like your program. Um, am I going to need to take a course in C plus plus or Java or net or you know um, Logo or or what have you? And I understand that this is new to you know very few people from public health traditionally have this background. Talking about too, just in areas like R um, and, and statistical code. Um, but in my view, the biggest challenge for from for age of this model, it's not at that level. Yes, that's a necessary prerequisite, and it's, it's way unnecessarily painful. It's, it's unnecessarily painful. As a computer scientist, I think it's shameful, actually, what's required. I think it's unnecessary, and it is um, terribly um, embarrassing for me as a computer scientist. This is the level at which you need to engage with specifying models. We can do it much better than that using the techniques of computer science. But that's not the big barrier. The big barrier is, is um, often coming up with model conceptualization and, and then model formulas. And that's a matter more of, of kind of mathematics and probably in statistics. And, and model conceptualization is a matter of kind of artful, um, savvy thinking about what needs to be in this model that brings together many factors, including, including human factors, in deciding what goes into a model. So if I think about the barriers that someone's going to face in becoming a virtuoso model, this, this lower one is actually not one of the two top challenges. The two top challenges are probably coming up with an adequate model of conceptualization model. Um, this is about implementation. It's just about describing the model in detail so it can be run. It's really what model you want to run, not the details of how you code it up. That's that's the more tricky. And similarly, the model conceptualization. What's the scope of that model? Those are the two biggest challenges. Um, the upper two, not that lower one. 
Um, and by the way, this leads to grievous mistakes. I have seen the most beautiful, beautifully high potential projects wrecked on the reef of um, mistakes in understanding this. I've seen projects where they have hired a computer programmer knows Java code to build, you know, to, to work on a project. It's on an, it wasn't in any way, by the way. Um, uh, it was full of code, the weakness project, I'll say. Um, uh, they hired a computer programmer to do this type of stuff. And the computer programmer was hopeless. Like, like a computer programmer doesn't know jack about this stuff, like model conceptualization and model formulation. If you hire a computer programmer to do that level of stuff, it, it's like hiring them to, you know, to build a, a, a hydropower dam or something. Like, it's going to burst. It's, it's going to be horrible. All sorts of bad things will happen. Um, just because this level requires some computer programming, don't think a computer programmer has any clue about this. You know, they're going to have no clue. Um, the model conceptualization, model formulation are the trickier thing. The computer programmer, if you get them involved, you really want someone who has some experience with modeling implementation, because otherwise they may go off and do all sorts of mischief and not realize that it's full of sound of fury and it signifies nothing that's significant because it's mathematical nonsense. Um, so just be aware, this is not a computer programming issue. There is programming involved, but that is not the defining piece of it. That's just taking your mathematical understanding of the model and putting it into an executable form. It's really these two higher levels that are the defining thing of what makes a virtuoso model. Um, if, if you have someone who's really good at these top two things and they don't know a whit of computer programming, but they get someone who's willing to work with them, test it into code, and keep them really closely abreast of what's going on, they actually could probably do pretty well. And there are models. Um, so just be aware, don't bug out about this lower level. Don't, don't get too worried, because this is not the defining feature that makes a good model, a good agent-based model. It's these two top levels that are much more important. And we're talking about the top level, okay? Never said that before. These are new, new, um, new slides. Uh, but I hope that's uh, hope, hope that's helpful. Um, this is an iterative process. It's by having a model that's implemented that you can run it, and you can say that doesn't look right, <laughs> and you can iterate and change your conceptualization of the model, and you iterate. Okay. Um, by the way, this also lays in groundwork you know, some great opportunity for interdisciplinary collaboration, right? Maybe, um, could a health scientist be involved in the two top layer? Could they, could they actually lead the two top layers? Yes. With the right person involved here and be really, really transparent and can do it. Um, this is not a matter about becoming a computer programmer. Computer programmer doesn't know jack about these things. Um, okay. Um, so model purpose for agent-based models is, is particularly tricky because we can put in arbitrary amounts of detail and we have to be really disciplined about model scope. Okay, so there's this principle of computer program called Yagni principle. You ain't gonna need it. And I like to talk about this for agent-based models. Um, the deal is less is more often. Um, putting things into a model has a cost. It's just that the cost is hidden, typically. If you put things in, you don't know what you're not going to be able to put in as results or what insights you'll be foregoing. Just be aware that adding things in, um, you know, often can lead to the model going in a different direction that foregoes uh, certain lines of, of insight. So the, the foremost encouragement of is to engage in incremental model development. It's to restrain yourself by building up a model step by step, piece by piece, bit by bit. Um, and with it, 
each iteration of the model modified to some small power. Maybe you add in a representation, you refine a representation, you change it, or you remove something, all that up. And to run this model, often you do what's called docking. And this is something that is discussed in the Asian race modeling literature in the book, I think by Axtel and Axelrod from the 90s, um, if I'm not mistaken, maybe it was from the 2000s. Um, uh, basically, you can often change it and then verify kind of with that new thing turned off, the new thing, make sure the model gives the same results, maybe you set the parameter to zero or something like that. Um, or otherwise, you understand the behavior with the new feature enabled. And, um, and you compare it against the old. And you learn from that to say, I made the tiny change. How did that modify? And you know, frequently these incremental versions you demonstrate to people, you can produce some insights along the way about where behavior is coming from. So we saw this yesterday, didn't we? I think we. We built up a model incrementally. That very model stands before us. Um, we built it up. Uh, um, so uh, so uh, I'll, I'll come to the question here in, in just a moment. Um, but we built this up incrementally. Remember that? We first added in is uh, never smoker, current smoker, former smoker. And there's kind of logical chunks that occur. Um, it's not that you know you add a never smoker only and you run the model. You don't always do it that. You build up a logical chunk. Maybe the logical chunk here is you kind of add in kind of the states and transitions before uh, between them, and you try running it and you observe the results, and then you you know you go and you add in um, uh, some. Some rate based transitions and, and you run it, et cetera. And, and then, you know, we ran that and then we added in this state chart and we ran that and they were independent. And then we added in uh, a situation where someone's status here, you know, accelerated. They're going to heart disease if they were a current smoker. And we saw how that differed. Then we added in mortality. This is the sort of pulse of modeling. But it's not just practical, it's, it's how learning takes place because you end up running it and you see something funky going on you didn't anticipate. And you say, that needs, that needs inquiry. You know, is it a bug or is it an emergent pattern that I didn't realize before? And you, know, you have to be a humble modeler to be a realistic in my mind. You know, there's lots of times where I add something in and I think, oh, it's going to make a tiny difference. And no, it, it made a big difference. And some weird thing happens and it's not a bug. It's just because my thinking was off base and I learned and I go forward. So building things up incrementally is, is key. And what this means in model conceptualization is a matter of, you don't just plan, well, oh, be there as a good great model I'm gonna build and and you know these things are endogenous, these things are endogenous, these things are ignored. And um and then just work for months and months and months towards that model. And you know, not ready yet, not ready yet, not ready yet. And then you you have it at the end. No, you're building along the way and you're learning along the way. And often that leads you to a bigger, better model, but a much more savvy bigger, better model. Because you've learned all along the way what really makes a difference, what changes things, what odd results come. And you emerge with a model that's much more savvy. It may be bigger, but it's much more savvy. So there's a question here. It seems clear to me implementation of code um, uh, is to be subsumed to, to conceptualization, but is conceptualization, it's expression math, um, easily disentangled? Well, that's that's a good point. And I think what um, Jean-Jacques is uh, referring to here um, concerns this uh, sort of diagram. So at the cost of you know, going back to that, I'll just say um, model formulation and conceptualization, I think of, and this is you know, not, I'm, I'm not presenting the canonical you know, consensus on this because I mean, there is <laughs> I'm aware of it. But, you know, my, my view as, as a modeler, um, 
I would I would say model conceptualization has to do with model scope and some understanding of what affects what in the model. Um, um, you know, what types of interactions, generally speaking, are captured. It has to do with sort of what the, what's included in the model, what's generated by the model, what is instead represented, but not generated, said it's told to the model. Um, but it has to do with the model scope, so like what, what's there, what's not, and what is connected to what, what depends on what. Model formulation is kind of how it depends, how it, how it captures that, um, you know, in, in specific terms, so the, the mathematics of it. And, and that's, I, I think of as, as kind of not orthogonal, you're right, but it's, um, I think of as model formulation kind of makes this more precise. And that's why I put this sort of downwards components here. It's almost like model formulation mod makes model conceptualization more precise. Model form implementation actually is not really under model. It's not that it makes it more precise. It just realizes it. So probably this should be over here, sort of alongside model formulation. It's just turning it into a, a runnable sort of uh, capturing of it. It's like making it runnable. Um, and that, that's kind of as I, I, as I view it. Okay. Um, so there's many benefits of incremental development. I'm not going to dwell on this, but it has profound benefits. And if you look at how modern software development is, is developed, it's incremental. It's, it, they go through what are called sprints and so on. And it has diverse benefits for learning, most importantly, but diverse benefits in terms of um, keeping the model in a way that can be, can be easily diagnosed if a problem comes in. You can show it to stakeholders. Um, you can get prioritization after each little sprint or each little um, um, adding in something. You can figure out, okay, given the learning that's taken place with respect to it, given the time that that took, what's my next highest priority? Um, and you can say, look, I'm going to add things in so, so you know, we, we finish by this certain time um, and instead of just overshooting it. So, if we start to think about this issue of model conceptualization, this first stage, or this first stage here, where you're setting the model scope, the boundary of the model, what's in it, what's not, um, there's a couple of, of things that I want to talk about. And maybe it's useful to just note here, you know, often these are, are part of them. You're, you're asking, what are your questions you're asking about the, the patterns you may be trying to explore, reference modes? Um, not necessarily over time, but it could be. Um, bound, the, the boundary, what's, what's in it and what's not. And what are the key entities? Like what, what are the factors in there that um, will be circulating? What are the outputs um, of, of interest? Um, so, you know, things that often end up influencing this are, you know, are you seeking to capture um, some sort of guiding theory? Um, uh, are, is there data that you're hoping to use to ground this model? If so you need something to compare against the data from the model, something the model produced that you can, you can sort of pair with um, the data. Are there interventions that you're seeking to evaluate? If so, you need to have the model in a way that will reflect the effects of those interventions. So if you have an intervention, maybe you're hoping to look at harm reduction efforts and opioids, and um, you want to evaluate the impact of uh, needle sharing programs, um, uh, to programs to, 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 to for exchange of, of clean needles and, and collect uh, dirty needles. Um, uh, you, or suppose you want to look at um, uh, supervised injection sites. You're going to need to have some representation in the model, presumably, of needle sharing, because you want to make sure you, you capture the effects of clean needle distribution. It's going to help predominantly by lowering the risk of people who share needles. Um, that, so you want to use different fields, or or maybe um, you want to you want to look at supervised injection sites. You're going to need to represent risk of overdose. You know, obviously for that. 
So if you want to represent certain interventions, you're going to need the model to kind of capture the effects of those interventions. Um, um, if there's aspects of heterogeneity that you're interested in, you want to make sure the policy doesn't disadvantage lower income groups by especially boosting the fortunes of high income groups at the expense of lower income groups, um, then, then you're going to need to refer represent that. If there are certain things that stakeholders need to understand in the model, they need certain outcomes, you're going to need to represent it. Probably the most, one of the most useful divisions, which is extremely widespread for discussion within system dynamics, but I see it almost a very little discussion, almost none in other areas, kind of thought continuum, is this division between endogenous things, exogenous and endogenous. And I'm going to explain this, and I want to refer back to that model we saw yesterday um, that we built up yesterday. And I'm going to ask you to see if we can get some understanding of how these things apply. So there are three types of things here um, endogenous, exogenous, and normal. The first two are represented, mark my word, they're represented in the model. Exogenous things and exogenous things and endogenous. The difference is endogenous things are the things calculated by the model. They're the things the model tells us. Endogenous things are things represented in the model, but they're things we tell to the model, they pre specify. That doesn't always mean they're a constant bound that never changes. No, no. Changes over time, but in a pre specified way, in a way that we've dictated ahead of time. It's not generated by the model. We've told it to the model. Endogenous things, model tells us. Exogenous things, we tell the model. Eggs, it's like outside. Um, we told it this. And ignore things are things that are office, often consciously put aside, maybe put in the parking lot for, for later consideration, but they're left out of the model. You know, they're relevant at, at some level, or they could be relevant, but you leave them out of the model. Um, because for now, they're not the foremost priority. And if you think of building up a model, what's going to happen is we're going to have incrementally. Initially, you're going to have the vast majority of things down here ignored. And you're going to be adding in over time some things that were ignored exogenous. And some things that were exogenous will become endogenous, potentially. You'll be simulating them explicitly. And you're going to build up a model by adding things in. And occasionally, you'll take things out. Maybe you'll switch something back to be exogenous, or you'll remove it because it's a distraction. You decide it isn't worth keeping in. Yes, Larissa. There's a really good question in Zoom about uh, the absence of data present um, having the same problem for all types of modeling, uh, or if there is data. Or if that is absent, might we start with one method over another? Yeah, this is a really good question. And I actually have, um, so I, I think to address this question, I think I'm going to go to this slide, okay? Um, and this is a really important thing. And again, it's something which you run into across modeling traditions. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, if only you had seen these things. Um, um, 30, 30 some odd years in the wilderness. Um, uh, yeah. um, so, um, I've, um, uh, I'm tempted to quote Bob Dylan. Um, I've walked and I've crawled on six crooked highways. I've stumbled on the side of seven misty mountains. Um, it's it's amazing um, that the modeling world out there, because you get people coming from totally different traditions, judging each other's models by that. There are some traditions, and I'll I'll hold up um, uh, micro simulation modeling, where you are dealing with models that are almost without exception extremely focused on data. They're informed by data. They're motivated by data. They live by data. They die by data. They, um, 
they are focused on theory explication where you have some maybe statistical understanding of how people evolve over time in terms of observable income, education level, you know, um, earnings, et cetera. Um, well, um, aspects of health status, what diseases are diagnosed. You're dealing with data rich models. And then you get other models that are like for totally different purposes. You got system dynamics models that are drawn, that are created to you know, bring together stakeholders uh, across the divide, of, 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 across, you know, across sectoral divides or, or uh, societal divides. You get agent based models that are like the shelling segregation model that have no empirical data in them, but they're incredibly useful thinking tools. They're really insightful tools. And, and you, know, you bring these groups together and there are fireworks. It's, it's, it's really quite, I mean, at some levels it's funny and some levels it's tragic. It's tragic comic. It's, and um, because you see all this, you know, smoke and fire, with, without really getting it, getting going forward, because people are judging each other and bashing each other by different standards. But just be aware that there are models for very different purposes. And my colleague, Ross Hammond, is, it finds um, it very articulate and describing these terms that, that I'd rather like theory building models. These are sometimes called stylized, um, uh, Carl Simon in, in Michigan refers to these as caricature models. These are models that are designed as thinking tools to help just capture a few undeniable sort of features of the situation and saying, if those couple features interact, what are the consequences? We're not trying to characterize the world and all its complexity. We're not trying to characterize a very specific context. We're just trying to say to the shelling segregation model, look, you know, if people are located in some space and if they can move and there are some spaces that are empty at any one time and they can move to and they have a preference and we distinguish people by into different groups by color, let's say, um, and they have a preference for living near people who look like them, what patterns result over time? That's what the shelling segregation model does. If you wanna run it, you can run it here. I mean, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll just highlight for those who, Learn by doing, just go in any logic, help uh, example models, and pull down the shelling segregation model. Um, and you can you can run it. So um, a Nobel Prize winner um, uh, economist um, uh, shelling uh, devised this model and um, and you can you can see patterns that are segregation like emerge. There is no empirical data in that model. No more, no more data because it's meant to think through how different things interact. And it's incredibly insightful because the age point patterns emerging from modest preferences. Those are theory building models. And they often are data um, poor. Um, they are often designed to build up theory that might eventually help us understand why we see such data. But they often have very little data that that lies behind them. Um, and meanwhile, way down here on the right hand side are a lot of theory exploitation models that have established theory, and they take it and run with it and try to see what are the logical consequences of that theory in terms of the trade off between interventions or in terms of explaining trends. They ask what's going on here. Um, and here you're typically capturing empirical data sometimes in rather um, exuberant fashion. And um, a lot of models in the micro simulation tradition, I mean, micro simulation is like almost all here. System dynamics tends to span this, um, although they, they tend to really flourish more on the sort of, uh, uh, I'd say, the first three quarters coming from the left part of this space. Um, uh, I mean, there's some over, over on the right hand side, I, I think it's fair to say, um, but they don't have as detailed characterization as the other part. Um, the street event simulation tends to live over on the right hand side here. And um, they they tend to put a huge amount of effort into putting data into their models. Um, Agent-based models 
you'll find a huge number of them on the left, the far left of this, and you'll find a growing number over here on the right hand side. Um, and and so you know, different communities live in different quarters of the space. Yes, Michael. Not to mention this is new as well. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I think you put your finger on just, you know, a brilliant um, opportunity. It's one that I sometimes muse about. And really what you'd like to have is a portfolio of models. Um, you'd like to be able to nimbly, because you can often nimbly create some things like the, the triad ideas and so on. You need very little data. And, and then you end up, using them for insights to try to motivate a couple things. One thing would be data collection. Another thing would be to motivate what, what might we put in more of a, you know, what theories hold water enough that we might explicate them in some sort of way. Um, and, you know, early in the pandemic, we did a lot of this sort of work, for example, um, but over time, you know, our work would tended to be dominated by this. Just be aware, and this is really important, that there's a, a certain um, preference a lot of model consumers have. Uh, it's not a preference, it's a first preconception that, you know, that models live in a certain place here. And most of the time, when people um, who haven't engaged in modeling hear about modeling, they think of models as like living exclusively down here. Particularly, you know, they think of them as kind of like crystal balls or something like that. That's a common misconception. And um, I think you really want to cultivate a, if possible, a couple different models. Be a humble modeler. Don't put all your eggs in one basket and try to learn from, from simple models at the same time. And you'll be surprised just how much learning can go on from these sorts of models. Um, I remember one boot camp where it was a hackathon where we, we built it, uh, built a model way down here for, for justice partners. We, we had really sophisticated models going, being formulated up here. Um, and, you know, for those who know my work, we had a particle MCMC model up there. We had uh, sophisticated agent-based models of, People forgot you. This was on remand, um, and um, you know, pre pre trial detention. And um, we were building up models here that we, that we loved, and they were great. And you know, they showed interactions between the justice system and health issues, and it was just awesome. Um, but the model that really like made the difference on the stakeholders' part was I mean, it was embarrassing. It was something I created like live in a we were in a meeting and we were talking about, you know, like inflow, outflow into, into um, remand. And so I, I just like built a little model in, in front of them with like stock inflow, outflow. And um, I was illustrating principles we had derived, we had sort of learned from this. this these models helped me shape my thinking. But I boiled it down into like this super simple model and I showed it to our stakeholders and like their lights turned on. It's like, oh, oh, so it's like an imbalance here between, it's not that the inflow is too high necessarily, that that's why we see these problems. It's not just that the, the outflow is too low. It can be, you know, an interaction between them, particularly the outflow lower than the inflow. Now, I don't know if that I would have gotten that insight, except if I had been thinking in terms of these models, but it was that simple model that actually helped, helped them explicate it. And I, the fact that I was modifying it in front of them in response to questions, they said, what if it was a seasonally, you know, seasonal input, how would that change the result when I could put that in? So my colleague, Jeff McDonald, also talks about going back and forth, you know, like starting here on the left, building up to something that's richer, and then distilling it down into something that's simpler and that can be shown. And from that exchange, I think it's incredibly powerful. You know, you, you can do that. And um, if, if they wanted to now get recommendations out, the same stakeholder 
would immediately want output from some these models on the right. It's not that he says like, you know, the model you showed me is the solution. No, no, no. It just helped him think through the issues more with greater clarity because it was fewer moving, moving parts that he could look at. And that was key for his insight because it allowed him to focus in the essential of you. So when it comes to data though, this picture is extremely important because there's not one story with models with data. If you're over on the right-hand side here, you will need quite a bit of data and data will serve multiple purposes. It will help to challenge these models that are depicting theory, help to evolve that theory, it will help to inform and parameterize them, help to calibrate them. Um, uh, all those, all the type of data plays a role. But often if there's very little data, or if we want to explore nimbly, we're over on the left-hand side here, and we're trying out ideas. And sometimes just to test our thinking, we're trying out, you know, simple ideas here to, to you know, in the absence of much data, um, to, um, to, to build up some think, thinking about what bit might be going on in the world. And we don't want to let these things on the left, um, you know, uh, ignore the possibilities there just because there's a lack of data. You know, I, a number of boot camps like these, I've been asked by people, how if there's no data? How do you work in an area where there's no data? In some ways, my colleague Jeff McDonald will say, that's when you need modeling the most. And I'm very sympathetic to that idea. I don't know that I could do it quite as much justice as he could in, in arguing it, but what I will say is that when there's no data, um, and often that's a misnomer. There might not be quantitative data, but there may be observations of some sort, some sort, informally. There may be some general knowledge, you know, that the system is highly noisy and it, you know, it varies over time strongly in terms of its output or something like that, um, or that it slowly grows and suddenly decreases or, or something along those lines. It may just be there's not quantitative like time series or measurement. But in these cases, I agree that sometimes building up theory with a model is, is useful to kind of think through what might be going on and where we might measure from the system effectively. So, um, so just be aware, models have different relationships with data and don't get caught into thinking there's one true relationship with model. It depends on the model goals. And uh, I, I want to bring home that this is something where, you know, the goal of the model will dictate whether you're over here or over here, right? On um, theory building models, if your goal is to build up theory is to help you think through the relationship between these factors, if it's to illustrate some high level undeniable features of the situation, um, you can deal with a model, it's a caricature model. By the way, does that, that does not always mean a system dynamics model with one stock and one flow in and one flow out. This could be, there's some wonderfully simple agent-based models. The shelling segregation model is just one of, of, of many. A simple little model with, you know, a simple state chart and, and networks can be just as powerful for thinking as a, as a um, model with, with a single stock with you know, inflow and outflow. Um, but, but, you know, if, if your goal is to kind of study trade-offs between interventions, which are quite textured, you're gonna be over here on the right-hand side and you're gonna need more data um, to inform that. Um, so I think you, you, you wanna be careful about where you lie in the spectrum. And if you go read the, the ABM literature, this is an ABM bootcamp. So if you wanna read the ABM, you'll find lots of models over here and you'll find lots of models here. Ross Hammond, Liz Brook, um, that, that shelling segregation model, they tend to play over here with some of Ross's models probably being somewhere up here. Um, a lot of our models are over here with some being over here, like our models in trust are, are definitely over here. For um, and you wanna recognize that the diversity of practice and don't get yourselves stuck in the situation that you think you only have to be here. You only have to be here. Um, mm -hmm. Do you ever employ something like a essential 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the time. So I like sketching out my models and often I do that before building the models, but sometimes I do it just to kind of think through issues regardless of whether I have a formal model. And this idea of model mapping is, is a very powerful thing. I mean, you can argue there's different views about whether it's a model. Um, I, I, I'm inclined to say it's, it's a model, but my colleague Jeff McDonald likes to say it's a model map, not a, not a model. Um, uh, but I think it's really, really useful to have that. And I think stakeholders often really you know, relate to that. I'm, I'm conscious of, of time, and we haven't had a break this morning. And so I'd like to suggest we have a, a 10 minute break and uh, you know, get yourself some refreshments and we can come back in the room. Yeah, Louisa. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so um, let's see. Um, so the, so actually, was this just the last question? Specifically, okay. So, um, yeah. So the question was, do I ever use things like causal loop diagrams or other forms of kind of um, informal model um, modeling sort of diagrams that aren't formal models um, as part of the agent-based modeling process? And um, not sure if it was part of the question, but but including for these very data-driven models, you know, sort of over on the right-hand side. The answer is absolutely. And we've experimented with some agent-based um, um, uh, sort of variants of causal loop diagrams. Um, so, you know, just two weeks ago, I was helping someone with a causal loop diagramming process, really insightful, involving um, uh, issues of COVID spread and, in, in in the context of the uh, uh, the meatpacking industry and so on, and um, it was it was it was very insightful. But when we build agent based models, often it's useful to kind of think about a causal diagram that's a little bit more textured, which has, for example, maybe representation of the different types of agents. Um, so maybe there's interactions between a patient and a physician, for example. Um, and uh, we might have networks in there. We might have spatial context somehow communicated visually. And when I'm saying this, I mean, it's, it's pictures. It, it's pictures that tell a story. And causal diagrams are very good if you're thinking about a high level aggregate sort of depiction. But if you've got these contexts with agents and networks and, and space or geography, um, you know, often I, I find that putting in some some sort of additional components to the diagram is quite useful. And so we have we built up some informal diagrammatic representations for doing that. Um, and we actually built a tool at one point for doing this kind of a, a Google Docs for drawing out these collaborative uh, modeling tools, uh, uh, modeling ma mapping. Um, which um, was was quite nice, and um, we need to kind of revive it. But um, yeah, so uh, hopefully that's that's helpful. Okay, so I think we'll break for ten minutes, and and um, we'll come back and we'll continue some other discussions on this model conceptualization area, and then switch over at some point to the incubator work. Okay, thanks. <laughs>